this episode of Trial Story, Betty Broderick shoots and kills her ex-husband and his new wife. She pointed the gun at them and she pulled the trigger five times. Is she the victim of a cruel ex-husband or is she a calculating killer? The way he treated me was just so awful and so cold. In this episode of Trial Story, from opening statements to the verdict, a woman scorned. The murder trial of Betty Broderick. I just thought he was great. I thought he was fun. He was smart. He was... He was the man that I chose to devote my life to. This man, she says, was her life. But, she says, this man was also her ruin. There really are no words to describe what you feel when you find out your husband's having an affair. She says he took the kids, took the money, and took the house. He got sole custody, no visitation. That meant I had no rights to ever see my children again. Then she took his life. I mean, it just was an explosion. Just, I moved, they moved, the gun went off, and it was like, ah! And it was that fast. Now, 43-year-old Elizabeth Ann Broderick, known as Betty, stands trial for murder. The story starts in 1965. Dan, a student at Cornell Medical School, and 21-year-old Betty Biseglia marry after a four-year courtship. Betty later works to put Dan through Harvard Law School. They move to California. They have four children, Kim, Lee, Danny, and Rhett. Dan and Betty Broderick soon cut a high-profile image in San Diego. Betty, a society wife and perfect mother. Dan, head of the San Diego Bar Association, making a million dollars a year as a malpractice lawyer. But he is also allegedly having an affair with his assistant, then 22-year-old Linda Colquina. When Betty Broderick confronts her husband about an affair, he denies it. And, she says, calls her crazy. Betty and Dan go through a bitter divorce. Linda and Dan get married in the spring of 1989. Seven months later, at 5.30 a.m. on the morning of November 5th, 1989, Betty Broderick gets in her station wagon and drives to the house of her ex-husband. Using her daughter's key, she sneaks inside and shoots and kills Dan Broderick and his new wife. Betty Broderick turned herself into authorities later that day. What occurred in the private world of Betty and Dan Broderick that led to his death? Are there circumstances which justify Betty's actions? Jack Early, Betty Broderick's defense attorney, told us his strategy. He hopes to convince the jury that Betty Broderick was an emotionally battered woman who, in the heat of passion, panicked and pulled the trigger, and that Dan Broderick drove her to commit the act by pushing her psychologically until she felt there was no other way out. But the prosecution has a very different the story. The undisputed evidence is that Elizabeth Broderick, the defendant, shot and killed two people as they lay helpless in their sleep. Carrie Wells, assistant district attorney in San Diego, was arguing that this is a clear-cut murder case. She and prosecutor Paul Burkhoff claimed that Broderick was a domineering and vengeful wife, unable to accept her failed marriage, and that when Betty Broderick pulled the trigger she planned. She premeditated her ex-husband and Linda Coquina's death. A premeditated murder doesn't require weeks and weeks of intricate planning. It requires only that a deliberate, considered decision to kill be made before the actual killing. She pointed the gun at them and she pulled the trigger five times. And this is not an automatic. This is a revolver. You have to pull the trigger each time in order to shoot this gun. And you will see that it's not a particularly easy trigger to pull. And you'll also see that every one of her shots was aimed to kill. But Dan was still alive and reaching for the phone. It's at this point that the evidence will show how clearly the defendant's intent was to kill these two people. What she did was to walk all the way around the bed over to where Dan was lying, to where, as she later told someone, she could hear him gurgling in his own blood. And what she did was she picked up the phone and ripped it out of the wall. 
literally tearing the cord in half. And she did it in her own words so he couldn't save himself. <coughs> there would be no chance to call for help. The evidence will show, and the bottom line is, she killed two helpless people because she hated them. And that is murder. Thank you. Defense lawyer Jack Early disputes that profile of Betty Broderick. You will realize, and you'll see, and the facts will show, that it's a housewife that's on trial. But you'll see that Dan Broderick, probably one of the most powerful and influential people in this community, is still here. And it still has control. Jack Hurley says that Dan Broderick used his legal leverage to drive Betty Broderick crazy. What you will hear from the evidence in this case is that she was hit by an avalanche. And the avalanche was one of litigation. And the easy thing that people will say is, Betty, why don't you get on with your life? Why don't you go to work? She didn't have her children. She didn't have her assets. She didn't have a life. Early says Betty Broderick went to talk with her ex-husband out of frustration, not with murder in mind, but suicide. That when she confronted him in a moment of passion, she pulled the trigger. The testimony will show that she did not go over there with the intent to kill Daniel Broderick and Linda Colquina Broderick, but from her own mouth and from all the circumstantial evidence, the testimony it will show that the reason that she went over there is to stop a situation that was putting her where she was and letting people know where she was and what they had done to her. And I think that after you hear all the evidence, you will reach the appropriate verdicts in this case. Thank you. The stakes are high for Jack Early and his client. If the jury believes that Betty Broderick was driven to her crime, that she acted in the heat of passion due to years of abuse by her husband, then she'd be guilty only of voluntary manslaughter, which carries a sentence of 3 to 11 years in prison. But if the jury believes that Betty Broderick planned to kill her ex-husband and his wife, then she'd be found guilty of murder in the first degree, which carries a sentence of 25 years to life. This concludes court is now in session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't the first time a jury will hear the case of California versus Broderick. Betty Broderick has stood trial in Judge Thomas Whelan's courtroom before for the same crime. The prosecutor was Carrie Wells. The defense attorney was Jack Early. But after more than a month of testimony, jurors could not agree on the verdict. They came back deadlocked. Judge Whelan declared a mistrial. One year later, Betty Broderick stands trial again before the same judge with the same lawyers arguing essentially the same case. So what's changed? The jury, seven men and five women, this time has been selected with the lessons of the first trial in mind. In fact, the defense has succeeded in allowing one juror to be seated who admits to having considered killing his former wife. This time, Jack Early will be paid with public funds instead of by Betty Broderick. And this time, as she later tells us, Prosecutor Carrie Wells will be more aggressive in confronting Betty Broderick on her story. While Wells has presented the physical evidence that she says proves that Betty Broderick premeditated the murders, her case really depends on credibility, not on physical evidence. To that end, Wells calls her star witness, Betty Broderick's own daughter, to testify against her. Good morning, Ms. Broderick. Good morning. Are you the daughter of the defendant, Elizabeth Broderick? Yes. Can you tell us how old you are? 21. Tell us, if you can, at this point, how you feel about your mother. Um, well, I love her, but I'm mad at her. Why is it that you're mad at her? Because I don't like things that she's done. Do you feel at all that you have some sort of obligation to take sides in this case? No. You understand that your only obligation as a witness is to tell the truth? Your Honor, Judge, 
the world to match that. Excuse me? Do you understand that your only obligation as a witness in this case is to simply tell the truth? Yes. And that's, no matter which way your answer cuts or you think it cuts, you just tell the truth? Right. How do you feel about your father right now? No our objection. Overruled to match that. Well, I still love him and miss him. Can you describe for us whether, from your observations, whether your parents had a happy marriage? Well, at the time I didn't think much of it, but they fought a lot. So, no, I didn't think of a happy marriage at all. Did, did, from your observations, did you ever think that they appeared to be happy together? At the time or now? Uh, at the time. Well, I was too young. I really wasn't paying any attention. How about that? But now? no, no. Why is it that you say now that you don't think your parents ever had a happy marriage? Because as far as I can remember back, they were fighting and saying they were going to get divorced. You indicated saying they were going to get divorced. Who was it that would say to you they were going to get divorced? My mom. And what would she say? She'd say, um, your father and I are going to get a divorce. Who do you want to live with? I, during this time while you were growing up, before your parents separated, did you ever see your dad beat or hit your mother? No. Was there any violence between the two of them? Well, at each other? Yes. Did, did your mother ever do anything violent towards your father? I never saw her hit him, but she would scratch him and stick her fingernails in his arm. But that's, I didn't, I didn't see her hit him. Were there ever any incidents where she threw anything at him? Yes. Can you describe? One that? night at dinner, he came in late, and, um, well, I don't know if that was the whole issue, but she threw a ketchup ball at him across the table. And then one time, we went to dinner, and we got back, and, well, we went out for pizza, and we got back, and she threw a stereo, and then she threw this thing this marble thing that has this little, I think, I think you, you grind something in it or something. She threw that. And that's pretty much all she threw. Was there a time that you recall when your mother uh, burned your father's clothes? Yes. Um, can you describe how she went about doing that? She, the room was overlooks the backyard. She went in and took all the clothes and threw them out the back over the balcony under the grass and then she dumped the drawers out and then she went down and put gasoline all over the place and lit it on fire and then she poured black paint all over the rest of it. While your mom and dad were married, did your mother ever appear to be afraid of your dad? No. Did she ever say anything to you about being afraid of him? No. She's bigger than him. She, was, she would laugh about that. She would laugh about the fact that she was bigger than him? Is that a yes? Yes. Under gentle direct examination, Kim Broderick tells of how she and her siblings were victims of a messy divorce. She says her mother left the kids at Dan's doorstep one at a time. Can you describe how it was that, that you ended up over there? Um. Well, it was on Easter, the night before Easter, and Mom and I got in an argument because I had this friend over that I wanted her to take home. And we had just been at Warden Springs, and she didn't want to take her home. She was tired, so she said no. And then we got in an argument, so I went back into my room, and then Mom came in and said that, that pack up and leave, that she, was, she didn't want me there anymore. I can go live with Dad, so then I packed up and left. So you packed up your clothes, and did, did she take you over to your dad's house? Yes. At some later point, did either of your brothers or sister come over to Coral Reef? My brother, Danny, came over the next day on Easter, and then my sister, Lee and Rhett, came over a month or two later. How, how was it that Danny was brought over? He was fighting with Rhett, and Mom had enough of it, so she told him to pack up and move with me. Did, did she actually bring him over? Yes. 
What was the what was his emotional state when he was brought over? He was really upset. He didn't want to come over there. Was he crying? Yes. Carrie Wells now introduces an important piece of evidence. Betty Broderick's own voice on an answering machine. A conversation between Broderick and her then eleven year old son, Danny. <laughs> your mother was saying in that conversation that we just heard the, the names that she was using to refer to your father the names she was using to refer to Linda were those um, kinds of things unusual for her to say no that's what she called them D did she talk that way often yes that's what she called them all the time so as far as as her part of that conversation that was not an unusual uh, way for her to talk or for her to refer to to your dad or Linda no this is a message to Ed and the We have one hell of a nerve dumping the kids here on the sidewalk and zooming away without making any attempt to communicate with me about my plans for the weekend. Make me sick, the both of you. Return my call right away. Thank you. Stop scrolling long enough to return my call. I left messages on the machine with the maid, with the secretary, etc., etc. I have very important things to ask you. You're making me mad. I'll kill you. Um, did, did you ever talk to your mother about not leaving the messages, not leaving vulgar messages like that, ask her not to do it? Yes. And what would her response be? <coughs> Forget it. She's going to leave the messages if she wants to. It's because they didn't communicate anymore. So, I mean, that was her way to tell him what she wanted to tell him that day. 
and to tell us what she needed to tell us, and, and that, that was her way of communicating. Was your dad afraid of your mother? Yes. She, afraid of what she might do? Yes. Uh, did, did he put in a, a security system, as far as you know, in his house? Yes, when we moved in, there was a system, and I think then he got it updated. So there was a security system. And, and how about gates up in the front of the house? Yes, that was after the car incident. After your mother drove the car through the front door? <coughs> right. And then he put gates up on the outside. Um, you had no access code so you could get in. Okay. Did, um, did your mother ever threaten to kill your dad? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Well, she would say it so that you really didn't believe her, though. She'd, like, say, well, I'm going to kill a son of a bitch. That kind of stuff. And then, but I don't never really took her seriously. She didn't really elaborate on it, like, exactly when she was going to do this or how she was going to do this. But she said that she was going to kill him. And then she'd also just say things like that she wished she would just die, and that she wasn't going to kill him, but she really wanted him gone. Did she ever so say we'll, anything about shooting him? Yes. What did she say? She said she was going to shoot him. That, that was around the wedding time. And she said she was going to shoot him. And she was going to shoot him in the head. And then she said some number, but I don't remember what the number was. It's like, I'm going to shoot him so many times in the head. Prosecutor Carrie Wells reads from Betty Broderick's diary. There is no better reason in the world for someone to kill than to protect their home, possessions, and family from attack and destruction. You have attacked and destroyed me, my home, my possessions, and my family. You continue to repeatedly attack and steal and destroy. You are the sickest person alive. A law degree does not give you license to kill and destroy, nor does it give you immunity from punishment. No one will mourn you. That's something that your mother wrote, is that correct? Yes. Was your father attacking and destroying you and your possessions and your family? Me? Yes. No. Was he attacking and destroying your mother's possessions or person? No. Let me ask you a little bit about um, your father and your observations of how your father treated you and, and treated the kids. Not what other people had to say, but what you observed yourself. How, how did your father treat you? He treated us really well. He, was, he wasn't too good at the fathering stuff at first, but then he got better. And he didn't really know how to show us emotions and stuff. He wasn't perfect, but he was a really good dad and he tried hard. Did, uh, how did he treat the boys, Danny and Rhett? Well, wow, really well. I think they got along great. Did he, did he love them? Yes, very much. It was hard because, I mean, it's always hard, I guess, when parents get divorced because there's always a tug war back and forth, but it's particularly hard in our circumstance. And, um, but as, as far, I mean, as much as I could tell, they got along great, and I know Dad adored them. Did, um, did he love your sister, Lee? Yes. Did you have any question in your mind that he loved you? No. The prosecution then turns to the day of the shooting. Kim Broderick at school in Arizona received two calls from her younger sister, Lee, who was with their mother. And what did your mom say as you were called? Um, I didn't, okay, I said, to, I asked her what had happened and she said that she went over there and that she shot, but she wasn't sure if she hit anybody. And then she said, okay, I don't know what she said first, but then she said, um, you, you know I had to do it, honey. I couldn't let him win. But one of us had to go. It was one or the other. Uh, I couldn't see, see handle what he was doing to me and you all anymore. He was destroying us. You know I had to do it. Kim Broderick's stark portrayal of her mother will be a tough one for the defense to challenge. But defense attorney Jack Early uses his cross-examination to suggest that Kim Broderick is biased against her mother. You talked about the time when uh, your uh, mother used to talk about divorce and ask who you were going to go with. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And you used to tell your father you, you were going to... 
Did you used to tell your father you were going to go with him? He said you don't have to. You don't have to answer that. Did you then? I think I told him. Uh, I, we, Dad and I didn't talk about that much, but I think I did tell him once that I wanted to live with him. When you were um, brought over to your uh, father's house to live, you thought it was inappropriate for your mother to have you live with your father. Is that correct? No, I thought it was inappropriate for her to single me out and kick me out of the house. The, um, so you wanted to stay with your mother? Well, I f thought if she didn't want the children that she should handle it differently and maybe talk about it rather than pack up and ship somebody out. The, um, sometime after the homicide, uh, did you ever, um, tell somebody that you felt it was uh, your job to come to court and tell a different story than your mother was? No, I did not. Did you ever say that there was a need for a different version to come out than your mother was giving? No, I said that mom wasn't telling the truth and that I was going to have to go to court and testify because mom wasn't telling the truth. That's what I said. So it's, uh, you felt that that was your function to come in and, and, and tell what the truth is, is that correct? Not my function, but if no one, if no one else was there, then it, and I'm the only person would know, then I, I assumed that I would have to come in and do that. Later, Jack Early questions Kim Broderick about her testimony in the last trial, and if she knew about the relationship between her father and Linda Kokina. You remember uh, being asked a question about Linda's name being brought up, uh, but it was never a fact. Never, ne nothing about an affair was ever brought up. Remember being asked that? Hey, Mom? Yes. I don't remember being asked that in particular, but... You remember testifying at the trial, don't you? Yes, Mr. Early, but I've done a lot of things between then and now, and I don't remember ever, exactly everything that I said. Okay. Well, at the time that you testified at the trial, you were trying to be as truthful as you could. Yeah, right, Jackson. I'm trying to be as truthful now, Mr. Early. I'm trying. <clears throat> There's nothing inconsistent about what was said before and what is suggesting is being said now. I object to this attempted impeachment. Defense attorney Jack Early's harsh cross-examination is a gamble. He has risked offending the jury by attacking a person who the jury may see as a vulnerable witness. Meanwhile, the prosecution's just getting warmed up. Carrie Wells calls to the stand an intimate observer of the Broderick family. Linda David was a housekeeper for Dan Broderick after the divorce. When you would have conversations with Ms. Mrs. Broderick, <coughs> did she ever talk to you about her feelings about Dan and Linda? Yes. Can you describe, would that be occasionally, often, all the time? Most of the time. She had a lot of hate for her former husband, and mostly that's what she would talk about, how much she hated him, things that had gone on between them in the past, things that were going on between them in the present, um, that type of thing. When you indicate that she had a lot of hate for Mr. Broderick, do you, how did you know that? What, what would she say? That's what she said. A uh, lot of hatred for him, a lot of name calling, a lot of threats. Um, fairly aggressive or violent language. Did she say anything about Dan and Linda or what she wanted to do as far as Dan and Linda were concerned in that conversation? When I said I thought that the court situation was all settled and behind them, she said that she was sure that Dan and Linda would like her to just go away and leave them alone and let them live in peace. But that wasn't going to happen. And she said that she was going to continue to make Dan miserable and make his life a living hell or kill him. The state calls another housekeeper, Robin Tuwa, to testify about Betty be Broderick's effect her on her children. Did you ever specifically overhear a conversation that she had with her son, Rhett, that was very upsetting to Rhett? Yes, I did. She um, told Rhett to get, she wouldn't see Rhett if she didn't get the out of the house referring to Linda. 
Okay. If if who wouldn't get Linda out of the house? If Rhett wouldn't get, I don't want to use that word again. That, that's fine. All right. She um. She would. The stipulation is she wouldn't see Rhett unless Rhett would get Linda out of the house. He was completely distraught over that. He he was very upset. Was there something that, that he did after that particular conversation? <clears throat> yes, he did. He was so upset. He went upstairs and he locked himself in the bathroom. I thought he was using the restroom. He was too quiet for a while. And I knocked on the door and asked him if he'd come out. And when he came out, he had scissors in his hand and he had taken clumps of chopped clumps of hair out of his head and saying he wanted to get the pain out of his head his mom put in his head it's been tough going so far for betty broderick the prosecution has painted her as an obsessed ex-wife out for revenge to bolster its case carrie wells calls a family services mediator dr ruth roth worked on behalf of the children during the broderick divorce while trying to resolve the couple's custody battle she had some surprising sessions with Betty Broderick. She was just very angry, and at that point, I let her run with it. Mm -hmm. I thought that if she got to say all the things that she wanted to say that, were, that I thought were pent up inside, then I could get to the agenda that um, I needed to deal with. Okay. And so I let her go. Okay. And, and then what happened? I... Toward the end, I told her that it seemed to me more in an attempt to mollify her, that she had been uh, the primary parent, that she had been what I call a stay-home mommy. And that it seemed to me that regardless of what happened, probably by the end of this mediation, um, she could get the kids back. And what was her response to that? She got even angrier. What did she say? She said, quote, I'm not going to be a single parent of four kids. He'll die first. Okay. What, um, do you recall how you responded to that? Probably said, what? And she went on. What did she say? She said, the less I see them or hear from them, the better. No bother, no kids. End quote. Comparison to, to all of the people that you've dealt with in mediating child custody disputes and obviously seeing different variations of anger, where would you put Elizabeth Broderick? She may be the angriest person I ever saw. She's one of the top two anyway. And Was Betty Broderick the cold-hearted woman that prosecutors would have the jury believe? The state calls the second child of Betty and Dan Broderick, Lee. Prosecutor Paul Burkhoff questions Lee about Betty Broderick's call to Lee the morning of the incident. What time was it approximately? Approximately around 7 a.m. Did you answer that phone call? Yes, I did. Who was in the line? It was my mom. What did she tell you? She said she was in trouble and she needed my help. What else did she say? She told me that she shot my dad. She shot the son of a bitch. She wanted to come to my house. I told her to come. Once she got there, did, the, did your mother tell you more about what went on? Yes. What did she tell you? She told me that she had, she thought she had shot my dad, but she, she didn't know because it was dark and the drapes were drawn. She wasn't sure. She said she shot the gun one time, but it fired five or six times. She told me that um, she didn't know what had happened because the drapes were drawn and it was completely dark. I was asking her if um, she had hurt anyone, if there was any screams or blood or anything like that. And she told me that she didn't think that she had hurt my dad because he had sat up and said, um, all right, you shot me, I'm dead. But what the prosecution may have gained could be overshadowed by the defense's cross-examination. The picture Lee Broderick paints is a very different one from her sister Kim's. 
Do you remember how your family was before they split up? Was it, did it appear to be you a happy family, sad family? Jackson Dennis. <coughs> yeah, overruled, you can answer that. Uh, before my parents separated, I thought we had a really happy family. The, you indicated that um, you, your mother, um, often when she would get mad, those, those, her statements would include a lot of times she was going to kill him. Yes. So would it always... A lot of times. I mean, would she, how would she say that? Would she say, he's, he's making me so mad I could kill him? Or would it all differ? Or it, it would all, it would all differ, but it all referred to her not, not being able to go on like this. And if things kept going the way they were going, she was going to have to kill him. Okay. The, um... And I take it that that would have been an expression she'd been using for a long time. Yeah, she, she would tell all of us she was going to kill us if we wouldn't do what she said. <laughs> like, take out the trash or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> did, but, but we didn't take it seriously, of course. Did, um, would uh, Linda ever call your mother names in, in front of you? He, she wouldn't use profanity, but she would call her fat and stuff like that, crazy, things like that, but she wouldn't use bad language. Would she uh, say that to, about your mother in front of the boys? Well, if we were sitting at the dinner table and Linda started to talk about my mom, my dad would tell her to stop because it made my brothers very upset. If, if Linda sat there and called her fat and crazy and things, my brothers would get upset. So my dad asked, would ask Linda not to talk about my mom at the dinner table or in front of my brothers. Okay. Did you ever hear your brothers asking your mother if she was crazy? Yes. Though Lee and Kim Broderick's accounts about the family vary, what emerges from both is clearly a family ripped apart by divorce. But as the prosecution rests its case, it's tried to keep the family drama in the background and Betty Broderick's behavior in the fore. Carrie Wells has hit on several themes throughout her case, that Betty Broderick was a woman scorned, a bad mother, and most important for the state's case, that Betty Broderick committed an act of calculated murder. Hey, proceed, Mr. Early. Now it's defense attorney Jack Early's chance to counter those claims. He calls his most important witness, Betty Broderick, herself. Elizabeth Ann Broderick, B-R-O-D-E-R-I-C-K. Jack Early begins with the first years of Dan and Betty Broderick's relationship. What were the discussions that you had uh, with Mr. Broderick about being married, about getting married? As soon as I started going out with him, he wanted to get married. Okay. And um, was that something that both of you talked about? Yes, we talked about it a lot. And what did you tell him? I told him that... You know, I wasn't even thinking about marriage. I had to get my college degree, and at that point, I was only starting my second year of college. And he said that I could do both, that I could marry him and finish my college degree. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it one at a time, because I thought each thing was rather a full-time job. Yeah. And uh, during the uh, time that the two of you were uh, dating, were you working? Yes, I always worked. Okay. And was Mr. Broderick working at that time? You no, know, he was mostly going to school and studying. Okay, and were you uh, in any way supporting that relationship monetarily with Mr. Broderick? I had a lot of spending money because I had a lot of jobs and stuff, so I had social spending money. Dan, Dan only had tuition money and, you know, his school money. So, yeah, I had a lot. Yes, I had a car and I had disposable income and it was my turf. It was, he'd never been to New York before, so I knew everyone and where to go and what to do and... Yeah, I use my money. Okay. Um, after the, uh, during the honeymoon and after you were then married, was there a, uh, a change in the relationship between you and Mr. Broderick? Yes, very much so. And what was that change? Well, what, a dating relationship is entirely different from a marriage. And during the dating relationship, I had my own job and my own money and my own car and I lived with my parents and I had some freedom and stuff 
and after the wedding he was in charge of everything and I moved in with him and um, he took charge of the bank books and the paychecks and everything and I more or less had to do what, what he said. Where were you, uh, where were you living during the, uh, that third year in medical school? When we first got married, I moved into a dormitory room with Dan, which was a little teeny tiny room that adjoined another room by a teeny tiny bathroom. And it wasn't designed for two people to live in it. Okay. When, uh, when you and Dan were courting and married, uh, was he someone you loved? Uh, yes, we had a lot of fun. It's very nice. The... Now, during that period of time, um, uh, what did you expect of a, of a husband in marriage? Expected him to be nice and be supportive and be the father of my children and that we'd live happily ever after. Now, was that a decision that you were willing to, to live with, um, him going to law school rather than going out and practice as a doctor? Yes, that was, that was fine with me, whatever he wanted to do. And why was that? Because that's a wife's job, you know, whatever the husband wants to do, it was my job to support him emotionally and, you know, psychologically, and great, let's do it. So we did it. As defense attorney Jack Early carefully questions his client, she remembers when she first began to doubt her husband's actions. And uh, was there a reason that you uh, discussed with uh, Mr. Broderick the fact that he was away from the home a lot? I mean, how, how you felt about that? Any discussions at all? Oh, it was constant discussions. I felt that, I felt that he was really neglecting myself and the children. I, I felt I spoiled him in the early years by not expecting him to do anything with us because of the schooling. And then after he got a regular job, I kind of expected him to get involved and be home on weekends and be home at night and to have a little more time for us. And he didn't have very much time for us. Jack Early questions Broderick about a church-sponsored retreat the couple went on in 1976 where they discussed and wrote down in a journal their expectations for their marriage. And uh, during the time that you were at the marriage encounter, did you uh, talk about uh, what you wanted out of a, a marriage? Definitely, that's what it was for. And what did you tell him you wanted out of the marriage? I wanted him to spend more time with us. That's all I wanted. Did you tell him what kind of, did you ever tell him what kind of physical things that you wanted? I wanted a sofa for the family room because we had this black leather chair that he would sit in all the time and I just didn't feel we ever got really close to one another. So, yeah, I wanted a sofa for the family room. That was my big desire in 1976. And did um, Dan talk to you about what he wanted yes. out of the marriage? Yes. Or what he wanted for you? What did he tell you he wanted? He apologized for, for not spending time with us and said what he needed in life were to reach these financial goals that he had set for himself way, way back, and only when he reached those financial goals would he then have time to be a nice person to me and the kids and to, and to give us time. But I, ha I had to give him more time and stick with him until he reached those financial goals. And when, when he got there, then it was all going to be rosy and it was all going to pay off and it was all going to be wonderful. But I had to be patient because he, he had to do that first. And. Uh... Did you agree at that point in time to stick it out with him and stay in California uh, based on the things that he had promised to you? Yes. Did he make, uh, at, at that time, any uh, uh, promises, inducements as to how he would be with the family as time he would spend with the family at home? He was supposed to in, in the book, you know, we're supposed to, you're supposed to make improvements, but he just further apologized and said, you know, he'd really like to get together, you're supposed to get together 10 minutes a day after a marriage encounter to enhance the intimacy in your marriage. He said, you know, I'd really like to do it, but I'm just too busy. I have depositions and I'm busy, 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 and I just, you know, I just don't have time for this. 
when is the first time that you can remember the year, if you can give it to us, where you, you felt that your family did not have any major financial problems, where there would actually be a, some spend, discretionary spending money? I never had any idea of what was in bank accounts or how much we owed or anything. So this is just my impression. My impression was that in 1981, Dan was purchasing and buying stuff, and so we had some money, not a lot of money, in 81, and that's the first year I felt we had any money at all. Okay. Now, at this point in time, where, it's, uh, uh, were you also, you and Dan, uh, doing more things socially? The progression from 1981 to 1983 was extremely rapid insofar as money. From 1981 to 1983, by 1983, we had a lot of money. In fact, money was to become a central issue in the divorce. Yes, By 1983, yeah. Roderick says she noticed a significant change in their relationship. I wasn't even home an hour, and I knew something was wrong. He didn't, he didn't <coughs> greet us at the door. He wasn't happy to see us. He was just acting very strange. And that was about, that was late at night when I came home with the children. And we had to go to a wedding the very next day in Laguna Beach. So we got all dressed up and drove to Laguna Beach, and it was during that ride up there that I heard what was wrong. He thought our house was tacky. He thought our friends were boring. He thought I was, he said I was old, fat, ugly, boring, and stupid. And he had never said anything like that before. Okay. At that time, were you fat? I didn't think so. Okay. And at that, uh, how did you feel about yourself at that time? Before I started saying those things, I thought I was a competent person, doing the right thing in life. I was proud of my husband, my house, my family. I was very high energy. I've always been very high energy. Had lots of friends, lots of activities. I was a great cook. I was a hostess. I, I just, I was pretty satisfied with how I was doing in, in life. Was there a change for that in the fall of 83? In September of 83, he came home and he said that he had, had hired someone, and I was very, very happy about that. I thought, whew, a release valve where he'll have more time for us and someone to help him because he had been so grouchy and under so much pressure. And I thought it was from too much of a workload. And so he told me that he hired someone. And did he tell you uh, who he hired? Yes. He told me he hired Linda Kolkina, who had formerly been the girl in the, in the lobby of the building who answered the phones. While Betty Broderick testifies about her disintegrating marriage, the defense is building its argument that Dan Broderick, in fact, provoked his own death. She testifies that she grew suspicious of Dan Broderick's relationship with Linda Corkina, even as he denied it, and that she became possessed with pleasing her husband. Did you believe him when he told you uh, at the time when you would talk to him about not having an affair with Linda Corkina? Yes. I always believed everything he told me. And before this point in our long-term marriage, by this point, I've never, never doubted what he told me before. If he told me he was at meetings, he was at meetings. If he told me he was out of town at depositions, that's where he was. But all of a sudden, every time he started telling me that he was working late and he was going out of town and he was doing this and that, I was suspicious that he was with Linda Colquina and that he was lying. Did you try to do something to, about the things Dan said that were wrong with you? Sure. I tried to... Um, I, I wouldn't say I tried to look like Linda Colquina. I didn't do that. I just tried to not be old, fat, ugly, boring, and stupid. So I couldn't do anything about old. And I lost weight, and I went down to a sickly thin. And I, I didn't think I was boring, but I quit all my society things and tried to stay home and give him more attention. And um, I just tried to really cater to him. Perf I tried to become perfect for him so he'd have nothing to complain about at all. Did you do anything medically about making yourself look younger? Dan sent me to some <coughs> client that he had to um, get wrinkles off my face. And I got braces on my teeth because I have a little tiny crooked tooth here. I just, I let my hair grow longer like it used to be in college. It was real long hair and with the kids I let it get a, a little shorter so I let my hair grow longer and I just tried to look as much as I could like I used to look when I was 19. While the family house was being prepared for sale, the Brodericks temporarily lived in a rental. Dan announced he was moving out. And did you talk to him about your, did he say anything about your marriage or what was going to happen? 
No. When I asked him about Linda, as I did again on April 15th, I asked him, you know, what did he do for our anniversary? And he said he went out with someone else. He kept denying that, the, that he was even dating Linda. He never even admitted he went on a date with Linda. But according to Broderick, they were still planning to buy a house together. And she believed the marriage could be saved. Finally, Broderick says her husband confessed. Well, he told me the truth. He finally told me the truth. Okay. Now, and what did he tell you? All he would tell, he wouldn't tell me any details or anything else. All he told me was, I was right. I've been right all along. And how did, you, how did that make you feel? Well, it kind of made me feel, feel better that at least I knew the truth, but it made me feel like that he had taken really gross, unfair advantage of me for a long time, switching. You know, now I'm, now I'm standing in this house that's empty. My kids are gone. I have no money. I have no control. I mean, it's a little late to be telling me the truth. And, you know, and then I've got all this stuff going on in my mind about typical Dan Broderick, you know, don't even begin negotiating until you're sitting on their chest, you know, and knock someone to their knees. And I've been really badly used and abused by a liar for over two years. And I, was, I was very upset and very angry about it. And he wanted to take me to a mental institution. That was his answer to me getting upset. Broderick says her husband had taken over the family house with Linda Kalkina and had taken the kids. And who had custody of the children at that time? There was no custody arrangement. He had, they were physically living in Coral Reef because that was the only roof we had that they would, could be happy under and safe under. And then he got a restraining order in October of 85 and he used that as custody because if I couldn't get within 100 yards of the house where my kids were, I couldn't get to see my kids. So he, I didn't realize it until a long time later that that's what happened. He used the restraining order as a custody order. And I shouldn't, I mean, that shouldn't have happened. I did, I was defiant and I did go see the kids as much as I could, but I was very scared because he was threatening to every time I came within 100 yards of my own house to see my own kids that I was liable to be thrown in jail. There are constant everyday problems with the children. I was hysterical being separated from them. I didn't like the babysitters. I thought they weren't being cared for. I thought they were being neglected. They missed me. I missed them. Roderick says she went to confront her husband the day she says he sold their family home out from under her. Did you return to the house at some point in time? Yes. Okay, and what did you do when you returned to the house? I banned my car into his front door. Okay. And um, when you... Uh, why did you run your car into, uh, into his front door? I was extremely hysterical. I was totally upset. I was crying. I, the biggest thing that bothered me, was, you know, besides the sale of the house, the biggest thing that bothered me was that the way he was treating me. You know, this is uh, the man that was supposed to take care of us and that I trusted and all that baloney. And uh, I went to him for answers. And the way he treated me was just so awful and so cold and just non-communicative. Like, it was just... It was just like, screw you, you know, just die, get out of my life, go away. He had no respect for me at all. You, then Roderick the relates a series of events Jones that she back. says Stand drove her anymore. to the brink. Now, also in 1986, did you, re did you, re did you start receiving uh, things anonymously in the mail? Yes. Okay, and what sort of things did you receive? I received a picture of Dan and Linda at a party. Uh, with a sticker on it that said, eat your heart out, bitch. Yeah. Were there other things that you got in the mail besides that? I would get white envelopes typewritten addressed to me with cut out newspaper ads for wrinkle cream and weight loss clinics and things. And it was all exactly the same time as that, but separate envelopes. Finally, Jack Early asks about the events leading up to the killings. Betty says she received yet another legal paper about her ongoing custody dispute. What did the letter say to you? The letter said to me... Don't, don't read the letter. Just tell me what you remember the letter saying to you. It said to me that you're going to jail, that you're going to be fined, that Linda's going to screw around with the machine again and keep you from your sons for the next two weeks, going to play her games again, and it's going to drive you crazy, and that's why she's doing it. It meant that... Um, that seeing the boys was going to be put off and put off and put off. And I just stood there and I, 
I felt so sorry for my boys that they were missing everything in childhood. And I already mentioned that Dan, that uh, Danny was 13. And so, you know, the older the kids get, and we miss all these things like Halloween and stuff, those moments are forever, forever gone. And they're never coming back. And so um, this meant to me that I was not going to get the kids for the whole school year, probably, and that I was going to have to waste money fighting in court about stupid things and that Dan was just going to jerk me around and mess up the money, undoubtedly, with the fines, and then... How was your mental condition then? I had been beaten down for so long, so many times, that I felt that all the resources a person draws on when they're in trouble, that I had over the years uh, exhausted all those resources. I, I couldn't, it was six years into this, I couldn't call my family and say, oh, Mom, look what he's doing to me now. I couldn't turn to any friends and for help. I couldn't, I had already tried every um, civil agency in this town. I had tried child abuse. I had tried battered women. I had tried the district attorney's office for help. I had tried the city attorney's office for help. I had called the ACLU. I had called HALT. I had called NOW. I had, you know, when you're in trouble and you're looking for help and you're crying for help and screaming for help, you try all these avenues, and I had already exhausted those avenues. I felt so victimized, and then I was angry, and this is all happening at once in my brain. You know, I'm, I'm explaining it one, at a, one time at a one thing at a time now, but it's all happening at once, and it's like, why are they doing this? Why the hell are they doing this to me now? Why can't they just leave me alone? Why can't they let me get control of my life and get my kids and just have a peaceful, normal life? I didn't know what kind of sick jollies they were getting out of driving me crazy. And I was saying to myself, you know, what do they want out of me? What the hell do they want out of me now? What do I have that they want? And the only answer I could come up with was that they wanted to just drive me crazy. They were just, it was sadistic what they were doing. There was nothing else that I could give these people to get away from them. What were you going to do when you went to dance? I was going to ask him for the kids and to just leave me alone. And if he wouldn't agree at all, I was just going to kill myself in his house, not down at the beach and not at my house. And I had been contemplating suicide for a long time. It's in, it's in the diaries. It, I mean, I was, ex I was extremely despondent in what was going on in my life here because I couldn't handle it. And I, I knew that if I had killed myself, it was going to be in front of Dan Broderick so that it, he couldn't just say, see, I told you she was crazy. I had nothing to do with it. When you got to Dan's house, did you take the gun with you? Yes. And what was the purpose of taking that? Every time I went to Dan's house in, in the past, I'd get this, you know, 10 seconds or I'm going to call the police. Or once I got there to talk to Dan and Linda was in the window saying, you want me to call the police and stuff? So I, want, I brought the gun with me initially to make them have to talk to me. And if they said they were going to call the police, I'd say, no, you're not. Did you plan to do anything if they didn't talk to you? I told you, yes. I, if they wouldn't, de just wouldn't deal with me and wouldn't give me the kids, I was just going to kill myself. Okay. And did you go into that? Did you then go into their bedroom? Yes. Okay. And what did you do when you went into their bedroom? Well, the motion that I made, although I don't think it was a big motion, the movement that I made into their bedroom woke them up, and they moved, and somebody screamed, call the police, and I said, no! And I just fired the gun, and this big noise went off, and, and then I grabbed the phone and got the hell out of there. But I wasn't even in that room. I mean, it just was an explosion. Just, I moved, they moved, the gun went off, and it was like, ah! And it was that fast. And now, at that point in time, when you left, do you know whether anyone was hit? No, I thought Dan was after me. Okay. Had, did, now, did Dan say... Um, did, do you remember Dan sitting up in bed and saying, okay, you shot me, I'm dead? No. Do you, have you ever said that? To, have you ever repeated that to anybody? I know Lily says I said that. So, so I must have said that, but <coughs> I heard Lily say I said that. I don't remember that. It's been a rough few days on the stand for Betty Broderick, but her real test could be the cross-examination. <coughs> Prosecutor Carrie Wells wastes no time in launching in.
you have <coughs> obviously testified for the last couple of days since last Thursday or so. And during the course of those couple of days while you've been testifying, you have done a, a fair amount of crime on the stand during your testimony. Uh, it is true, is it not, that during the last trial, uh, when you would return to jail after testifying, <clears throat> that you would laugh about having cried in front of the jury? No, that's not true. That's not true? No. Isn't it true that you told Deputy Woods, a deputy at the Las Colinas Jail, that when you cried, the jury just ate it up? No, absolutely not. You never made any statement to that effect? No, I never, never did. I couldn't have made that statement. Isn't it true that when you talked to Deputy Woods that you told Deputy Woods, for example, one day after testifying that it was a good day today, I had the jury eating out of my hands? No. Carrie Wells argues that Betty and Dan Broderick were never happily married, challenging the picture defense attorney early painted in his direct exam. It is true that you had discussed divorce on many occasions with Dan Broderick during the course of your marriage. I don't know. No, we didn't discuss divorce. You it threatened divorce on many occasions. The right? same way I, I've been said to have threatened to kill him, yes. Well, you didn't just threaten to kill him. You did kill him. Well, and we did get a divorce. Yes. And you threatened divorce even in the first year of your marriage, didn't you? And probably to kill him in the first year of my marriage, too. Yes. Terry Wells hammers away at inconsistencies in Betty Broderick's testimony. Is it not true, Mrs. Broderick, that in the year of 1987, after the court ordered support of $16,000, that Dan Broderick paid you every cent that he was ordered by the support, by the court to pay, and he paid it in the first week of every month of that year? It's not my recollection in the beginning. In that first month, he played with us somehow, and I had to have the court order redone because of this little loophole. That's my recollection. But he was court ordered to pay that money, so he had no choice, but he filed an appeal because he didn't want to pay it. Prosecutor Wells grilled Broderick on a series of incidents that she says show Broderick's hatred toward her former husband. Now, it is true in 1985, after the separation, when Dan Broderick moved back into the Coral Reef house, that you did vandalize the Coral Reef House? Yes. On October 19th, 1985, you threw two bottles of wine through, large, through a large window. You shattered a sliding glass door, upended the television set, broke the cover on the stereo, smashed two lamps. I threw the bottles through the window on that Saturday morning when Dan took Rhett away. But that's all I did. The rest of the stuff is lies, always has been. You didn't recall breaking the window at the Coral Reef house either when you went over there to burn the carpet until you were shown the photographs, correct? No, I didn't. And when you were shown the photographs that you had broken the window, then you remembered that you had broken it, No, right? I, don't, I don't really remember being there, no. So you still don't remember the fact that you broke the sliding, uh, the sliding glass door at Coral Reef when you went over there that day? No, but I'll believe I did it. Well, zeroes in on Betty Broderick's treatment of her children particularly the language she used around them. You said before that you thought it was just water off the duck's back. No big deal that you talked like that to your children. That's what I mean. Over the years, it had no effect on anyone of any kind. Isn't it true that every single person who knew you and who knew what was going on told you it was having a tremendous effect on these children? Like who? No. You I... didn't just call them those words. You were, it was how you used the words. It was how you used the words to destroy the, the children's self-esteem. The children's self-esteem? Yes. I'm not with you on this. What are you talking about? How about when Danny asked you what the name Broderick meant when he was doing a project for school and had to talk about what his last name meant, and you told him that it meant And when he told you, Mom, come on, be serious, I have to do a, pro a, a, a project for school, you told him it means do you think that has anything to do with a young boy's self-esteem about his own name? I don't recall no this at all. I'm so argumentative, sustained. Carrie Wells finally leads Betty Broderick to the morning of the crime. What exactly did you expect to accomplish by confronting him on that Sunday morning at 5.30 in the morning? I wanted him to give me the kids. Okay. And so you felt that by breaking into the house and confronting him in his bedroom at 5.30 in the morning, that he was going to be inclined to think at that point that you ought to get the kids? He was going to be inclined to listen to me. Okay. You did see Dan and Linda on the bed when you entered the room, correct? 
I have no recollection of seeing them at all. Well, how would you know whether Linda or Dan moved if you didn't see them? I know now who was where, and I know that I, I had the impression then that she was closest to me, but I don't remember seeing her. Well, you can't have an impression about something unless you saw it. You brought the gun for a show of force. You brought the gun to make them to listen to, to you. Him, right. Well, when you entered the room, you didn't use the gun for a show of force. You didn't use the gun to say, hold it, I want to talk to you, Buster. You shot. I didn't have a chance. It, you didn't have a chance? What do you mean you didn't have a chance? Because it all happened so fast. I'm telling you, I didn't, it wasn't a thought process. I moved, they moved, the gun went off, and it was over that fast. When you pulled the trigger, obviously that was a voluntary action on your part. You voluntarily pulled the trigger. I don't remember voluntarily pulling the trigger, well, no. Okay, we have, we have two different kinds of actions that people can be involved in. One is involuntary, like your heart beating or your, or your pupils dilating. We don't have any control over that. When somebody pulls a trigger, you have control over that. It's your brain telling your <coughs> finger to pull the trigger, right? Your Honor, the question, that's argument. It's a stand Sustain. Well, are you suggesting that you had some sort of uh, epileptic fit that made your finger uh, go pull on that trigger, or did you voluntarily pull the trigger? Your Honor, objection. Where was the gun when you walked into the room? How were you holding the gun? I don't remember. It must have well, been Well, were in you my holding hand. it, pointing at them as you walked into the gun, at, into the room? I don't think so. I think so it must you have had been in my right hand. And how was it when it was in your right hand? Were you walking in it with it down to your side? Again, I didn't even walk in. I entered that room. That's how fast. When you entered the room, how were you holding the gun? I would have assumed at my side. I don't know. Okay. And so when Linda moved, you had to bring that gun up and point it at her to shoot her, didn't you? Right. I'm going to object. She's asking me to assume and speculate. Overall, you match that. The I reflex action didn't make the gun go off in the floor, did it? No, I went. Like that. So you pulled the gun up and you pointed it at Linda to shoot her, didn't you? I didn't point it at anything in particular. Was the gun pointed at Linda's chest when it shot her? I don't know. I'm telling you, it was dark. I didn't see Linda. I couldn't have pointed it at anybody's chest. After seven days on the witness stand, Betty Broderick finally steps down. While Jack Early may have suffered a setback, he continues calling a parade of suburban San Diego women to testify on behalf of Betty as the good wife and mother. Would you see uh, Betty with her children? Yes, I did. And how was she when she was around the children? Absolutely beautiful. Just, uh, they loved her, she loved them, and uh, Betty wanted the kids to be back with her. She wanted to provide them an environment where a parent was in the household all the time with them. I was, she was a very creative mother. Um, she, they were basically the focus of her attention and her energy. She had been a teacher and that's all she knew and that's all she ever wanted to be was a mother and a teacher. So she interacted beautifully with children and enjoyed them. And I, I don't remember her not in sweats and in cookie dough and paintings. And um, I, I was amazed at how much she could do in, in a day. Her, her interaction with children is excellent. While character witnesses are important to Jack Early's case, so are experts who can testify to Betty Broderick's state of mind. He calls a psychologist who testifies that Broderick suffered from depression as a result of the way she says Dan Broderick treated her. A turning point in the trial comes when an expert on emotional abuse, Dr. Daniel Sonkin, is blocked by the prosecution from testifying as he had in the first trial, that Betty Broderick was an abused woman. Obviously, uh, the court is taking a position at this time. Though his testimony wasn't barred, it was so limited by the judge that the witness himself decided not to take the stand. And finally, the defense rests its case. Is Betty Broderick the victim of an abusive man who killed in a moment of passion, or... Is she a calculated murderer? For a second time, a jury will retire to deliberate on the fate of Betty Broderick. In California, there is a thin line between first degree and second degree murder. To find Betty Broderick guilty of first degree murder, the jury will have to find that she deliberately intended to pull the trigger after reflecting on her actions. For second degree murder, only that she intended to pull the trigger with no deliberate planning. 
For voluntary manslaughter, the jury must only be convinced that the trigger was pulled in the heat of passion. Depending on what the jury decides, assuming a conviction, Betty Broderick could be sentenced to prison for as little as three years or for the rest of her life. After four days of deliberation, the jury returns. Mr. McAllister, I understand the jury has reached a verdict. Yes, that's correct. Would you give the forms to my bailiff, please? <coughs> we, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Elizabeth Ann Broderick, guilty of the crime of murder, and fifth degree thereof as murder in the second degree. Victim, Daniel Broderick. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, Find the defendant, Elizabeth Ann Broderick, guilty of the crime of murder, and fix the degree thereof as murder in the second degree, victim, Linda Broderick. And we further find... The jury's verdict? Elizabeth Ann Broderick, guilty of two counts of second degree murder. Jurors told us that a turning point in the trial was Betty Broderick's cross-examination, when her credibility was seriously undermined by prosecutor Carrie Wells. And the jury told us the verdict was a compromise. One juror said that she believed Broderick and tried to hold out for manslaughter. She only agreed on second-degree murder to avoid another mistrial. The verdict means that Betty Broderick must be sentenced to 15 years to life for each count. The question, will she serve time for each, or can she serve them at the same time? Thomas J. Whalen, judge presiding. So the stakes are high once again two months later at the sentencing hearing. My sentencing decision in this case is based solely on the evidence that I heard during the course of the trial and solely upon the laws of the state of California. So for count one, she sentenced to the Department of Corrections for a term of 17 years to life. Betty Broderick is sentenced to consecutive Since sentences amounting to 32 years to life in prison. Is she reconciled to spending the rest of her life in prison? I don't think that she is in a position now to understand what that is. Um, I don't think that she's been battling for so long, I don't think she's got to the point of contemplation about what does this really mean two years from now or three years from now or four years from now. She's still dealing with the immediate so much that it's very, it's gonna be, it's gonna take a while for her to understand that. Barring a successful appeal, Betty Broderick will be nearly 60 years old before even being considered for release from prison. For Court TV, I'm Cynthia McFadden.